Hey guys and welcome to the channel. The first quarter final is done and dusted. Rafa Nadal beating Denis Shapovalov in five sets, a thriller to say the least. And Rafa Nadal carries on his run at the Australian Open. Afterwards, he said he was surprised he'd even made the semi-finals, given he was unsure if he was even going to play the tournament at all. But he carries on his march towards a potential 21st slam and obviously tied with Roger Federer and Novak Djokovic on 20. He will face Matteo Berrettini in the semi-final, who beat Monfils in a tight five-setter as well. But we're going to talk about this and the two lefties going at it, young versus experienced. Denis Shapovalov had a very, very slow start to the match. Uh, the first two sets, very loose. He'd actually hit more unforced errors than winners in the first two sets. And for Nadal, it was very solid. Uh, in fact, in the first set, he hit nine winners to three unforced errors, very tight. A couple of double faults, but overall, I think it was four in the first two sets combined, but hit quite a few aces and unreturnable serves as well, served really well. And overall, just played a very solid game. Good depth on the ground stroke. Shapovalov made a lot of mistakes, especially trying to hit that into in forehand as well, which normally he would, he would nail it really, especially the one where he tries to go round the backhand side, go into in, and it's a shorter slice from Nadal. He's able to step in and put it away, but he missed a lot of those forehands, and he was struggling quite a bit. On the backhand side as well, as erratic in those first two sets, and he lost them, rightly so, uh, because of a great deal of inconsistency. But then from the third set onwards, he came into his own, for sure. Nadal had some breakpoint break point opportunities, sorry, even in that third set, Quite a few, actually, as well. Kept on getting love 30s on Shapovalov's serve and had chances to then make chances, make opportunities to break. Didn't manage to do so. Uh, his return position was very interesting in the first two sets. From what I saw, apart from one or two second serves, the majority of the time he was very close to the baseline, uh, like he was in his previous match against, um, well, against Manorino and also before that against Hatchinov. Against Hatchinov, he lost a set after then reverting back to going four metres behind the baseline, similar to his first serve return position. But in this one, he stuck within the first two sets and he he got rewarded for it. It paid dividends and he managed to return pretty well, I thought. And he is arguably one of the best returners ever uh, to play the game. But some of the returning, on the, especially again on the second serve, was really, really impressive. Very deep on the toes at Shapovalov at times. If he was going down the middle, it was very good depth to make Shapovalov have as little time as possible. Really rush the Canadian. And we know he likes to take big cuts of the ball as well. So that affected him a great deal. Uh, for Shapovalov, quite a few missed returns, etc. as well. And that wasn't great from his point of view. But then we go into the third set and it all turns around. Uh, as I said, Nadal had... Big opportunities in that set at the start to break Shapovalov. Didn't take it. Uh, didn't manage to make opportunities as well to potentially break Shapovalov at love 30, 15-30s on, this, on the Canadian serve. And in the end, Shapovalov got through that set and managed to break Nadal towards the end of that set. And Nadal also complaining about some type of stomach pain uh, had the trainer come on twice in that set. And it was that set. Shapovalov went up to the net and talked to Nadal. And that was after he'd uh, talked to the chair umpire and just gestured to the chair umpire, complaining that Nadal was playing too slowly and that the shot clock had already passed. And Nadal was basically, you know, abusing the shot clock and taking too long. However, the chair umpire said, look, it's got nothing to do with me. He's actually playing within the time from what he, you know, from what he knew and understood and said, like, you know, you need to go and talk to Nadal from what I could gather they went up to the net and obviously Shapovalov said something along those lines and uh, very animated Nadal, very calm and uh, definitely bothered him, I think, Nadal after that as well. And he doesn't normally get bothered by much, uh, but I think it was more the fact that someone uh, such as Denis Shapovalov, who before this match anyway, had talked a lot about how he really admires Nadal uh, and, the, and his game and what he's done uh, on tour, etc. over the past number of years. And then to kind of, you know, get a little bit tetchy let's say uh, during the match was probably a bit of a shock to Nadal but either way uh, he brushed it off Shapovalov and then went on to win that set and started striking the ball really really cleanly uh, what really impressed me from the Canadian was that as soon as Nadal's level dropped a little bit 
his level rose and went through the roof at times. That was that fourth and uh, third set, so third and fourth set. He was hitting some beautiful ground strokes. I mean, the depth on the ball was fantastic. The velocity as well across the surface, really impressive. And the big, biggest thing for me is that he wasn't hitting really flat over the net and taking huge risks in that sense. It was actually with a pretty good amount of coverage, huge topspin, and getting the ball so, so deep into court. I mean, Nadal at times was managing to, well, trying to dictate with the forehand, uh, you know, moving Shapovalov side to side. And there was a couple of shots where Nadal, for example, would go cross court, go really deep, almost clipping the baseline. Shapovalov somehow would get a forehand, for example, going down the line in return. And it would again be with a similar amount of depth and velocity. And he was moving really well, I thought, in the third and fourth set. Uh, he definitely capitalized on the the lack of first serves from Nadal in the third and fourth set and also the lack of potency on that on that uh, on that serve as well he missed quite a few first serves and when he did get in there weren't a lot going into the corners as they were in the first two sets a lot down the middle of the box he served quite a few doubles as well Nadal in the end I think he ended on it was 11 double faults uh, for the match and the third and fourth set majority came in those two sets and yeah I mean he just he struggled a great deal he served a double to then bring up a break point for Shapovalov ended up getting broken uh, he also had a couple of games with his 40 love up uh, and then had to go to Juice Nadal. So he was just struggling a great deal behind the serve. And Shapovalov was actually starting to serve really well, started coming into the net, volleying very well, uh, and overall started to raise his level and outplay Nadal, to say the least. And the Spaniard struggled uh, in those third and fourth sets. And obviously the stomach issue, I think he just seemed a little bit under the weather more than anything. Um but it was a very intriguing couple of sets. And being the Rafa fan I am, which you guys will know watching the channel, of course, you know, I'm a tennis fan first and foremost, as I always say. But of course, I wanted him to win. Uh, but if he lost fair and square, then he loses fair and square. But after seeing those third and fourth sets, I just thought the momentum is so, so much in favor of Denis Shapovalov that it was going to be extremely hard for Rafa Nadal to come back into that fifth set, considering he was struggling to move as well. Uh, I don't know whether it was an abdominal strain or whether it was just a, face, a case of him not feeling well. He, didn't, he was very vague after. He had a couple of pills um, as well. And then uh, I'm excited that he was feeling under the weather, uh, which is understandable. Uh, a lot of kind of blowing the, you know, they've got the tube that air comes out of him into his face and and all sorts and i just think for him it was a very very intriguing uh couple of sets and he clearly made a lot of errors he had to hit a lot more backhand so i think it was in the first two sets he was only hitting uh if i'm not mistaken it was 30 28 percent uh of backhands of his ground strokes were backhands so if you think about it, that's 72 percent of his ground strokes he'd made into forehands or into his forehand side uh, and then 28% backhand. So that's ideal for him. He wants to make as many balls into fat forehands as possible. But then in the third set, uh, it turned around completely. He was hitting 50% of his ground strokes as backhands. Now that to me shows the, the lack of movement and mobility after he started to feel under the weather, not moving as well, not able to run around that backhand as effectively, uh, and then having to hit more backhands as well. It's not a bad shot than Nadal backhand, but it's not as hurtful as a forehand. We know that. And Denis Shapovalov started to serve extremely well. Nadal changed his return position, uh, went to revert to type, going to the three, four meters behind the ba baseline. And look, on clay, it's, it's perfect. It works. And uh, he can get away with it for sure with the, the high top spin, loopy forehand with uh, high velocity. But on these, hard, on these hard courts that are quicker, you need to step in. And uh, he stopped doing that for a a period and it definitely hurt him uh, but then we got into that final set and he went back to it and I know some people have said it's a tactical ploy uh, because at times he was struggling to read the Shapovalov serves and then he thought look I'll go back and then adjust and you know I give myself more time so I can at least make the return but when he was making those returns I would say 75% to 80% of the time they were down the middle of the court with not much on it loopy short and Shapovalov would end up putting away uh, that short ball or being on the front foot straight away whereas uh, for Nadal stepping in at times yes he would potentially miss the return and might just go uh, go long or 
he'd, you know, it would be an unreturnable serve. But then it wasn't a case of 75 to 80% of those returns were long. Um, it was more a case of, uh, sorry, we're short. It was more a case of actually he was getting a large proportion of those returns when he was getting them in deep and then managed to win those points. So he was winning a larger proportion of points on second serve when he was stepping in. Now, I can understand, he said after as well, that he was struggling through the serve. So for me, it was, but why does he either need to be on the baseline or four meters behind the baseline uh, for that second serve return position? And it seemed like he then adapted in the fifth set. He thought, look, I, I'm probably too far forward. And if I'm struggling to get a, a great read on the second serve, then maybe, and Shafavala was hitting that second serve pretty big at times, why not be, get somewhere in between? and find that sweet spot. And then I think he ended up being about a foot behind the baseline, which is fine. Stepping in so that he was just behind the baseline when he was actually making contact. And it worked really well in that final set. Now, in saying that, Shapovalov blew it in the, in the fifth set. He really did. Because, as I said, he had huge momentum going into that final set. And he was serving first, and he blew it. He blew it, he blew it, he blew it. It was... Um, yeah, it was just really shocking to see. And sorry, he didn't serve first, he served second. But Nadal, he went 30 love up in his service game. And the reason why he went 30 love up is because Shapovalov hit two forehands. That was just such bad errors, really bad errors. Then he just let Nadal off the hook completely. Nadal managed to hold, kind of gripping on, really, to uh, end up holding in that first game or the final set and then Shapovalov it was it was really really poor from him it really was um I mean he conceded the break in a ridiculous fashion uh first of all it was a short ball forehand uh went long open court really easy shot to make then it was a forehand uh down the line just missing the tram line but again like didn't need to hit it uh that close to the line the double fault was in there and then also it was a shank on the backhand side and that was it broken straight away and he had the momentum he was he had Nadal on the ropes even though Nadal managed to hold Nadal was struggling physically you could see and he was being outplayed and the momentum wasn't with him and he rightfully said after and that just shows what type of character Nadal is he said I got a bit fortunate at the start of the fifth set and he did because Shapovalov gave him he gifted him really um, a couple of games there and he gifted him the break and then Nadal said okay well I'm in this now and uh, I think he was there for the taking, Rafa, if I'm being honest with you on that fifth set, but Shapovalov just couldn't make it work. And then Rafa was quite professional after that, I think, uh, managing to get through, obviously, 6-3 in that fifth set. Uh, yeah, a couple of double faults at times, but managed to pick out some big first serves when it mattered in the pressure points. And that was the biggest difference after he then was three love up and a break up in that fifth set. Shapovalov, yeah, I mean, for me... Didn't make enough returns. So he went, basically went to the Shapovalov on the first and second set, really erratic. And that's the biggest, I think, criticism that will be levied at him, that he's not able to maintain that level that we saw in the third and fourth set for three sets. Um, he can do it for two, but he's just not able to do it for three whole sets. And that's why he then struggles against these guys, right, who are top 10 and are very consistent. And Nadal was relying on his consistency and being more solid than Shapovalov, really, more than anything, because he knew he wasn't going to be able to blow Shapovalov off the court. Uh, and then when he obviously was physically uh, hampered a little bit as well, he just thought, well, even more so, I'm not going to try and go hammer and tongs at him and try and blow him off the court. I'm going to have to be tactical in the way I play. And a couple of nice uh, backhand slices, short as well, cross court, good angles found. And Shapovalov, he really struggled to return the Nadal slice on his backhand side. Ideally, he'd go slice to slice. Um, that's always what a lot of people say in coaches. And you'd think, okay, well, why doesn't he just hit a backhand slice? But he his backhand slice is not particularly good. He doesn't have huge confidence in it, doesn't hit it very often, and there's a reason for that. Uh, and then the back the drive backhand, right? It's very hard to hit that at your ankles. And Shapovalov then tried to run around a lot of those backhands uh, to hit the that slice the problem with the slice obviously it gives you less time it's so low with the net doesn't bounce as much as well so you don't have as much time to run around it and there's a lot of times where Shapovalov got caught really trying to go, run around the backhand didn't have enough time but really didn't want to hit a backhand uh, in return so 
yeah, overall, some huge learning points. He smashes racket um, when he lost that last point because it was, a, well, it was an unforced error. He had an unforced error to concede the set. And I think Nadal will look at it and say, you know what? Uh, that's a solid win uh, for sure. He played a couple of really good sets. He's got a couple of days to rest and they're saying he's going to be ready for the semifinals. I think he'll be fine. I'd be very surprised if he doesn't play it. And uh, he'll play Berrettini in the semifinals. For Shapovalov, what next? I mean, clearly some things to work on, but some big, uh, you know, positives as well. The serve was firing nicely at times. I like the way that he comes into the net, regularly tries to utilize um, the net play, and, and he doesn't volley badly. I think it's just at times he's a little bit all over the place um, mentally more than anything. Uh, and clearly a clean strike with the ball on both sides, but needs to develop that backhand slice and also uh, know how to, I think, counteract an opponent slice as well uh, to his backhand corner. Uh, but there was some fantastic hitting from him in the third and fourth sets, some huge forehands. And as I said, the depth found uh, in those sets, especially from some of the shots that Nadal was, uh, was throwing at him, it was really impressive. At times, Nadal was throwing the kitchen sink at Shapovalov and he was just returning in kind and managing to get through those points and win the exchanges, which you wouldn't expect because historically, and as, as a matter of fact, most of the time, he has a, an inferior shot tolerance, to be fair. But in this match, and the, well, in those two sets anyway, it was definitely superior. Right, let's go over the match stats because I just want to go through it um, for those who went on the live stream. Also, thanks to those who do, did join the live stream. It was fantastic to have you guys on. It was a, it was really good fun. Really, really good fun. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, we'll be able to do at least a couple tomorrow as well. Uh, so in terms of the ace count, you can see that 20 aces for Dennis Shafavala. So really impressive in terms of the ace count, I thought. Uh, eight for Nadal. 11 double faults, which as I said was alarming. The eight aces, might, it looks misleading, obviously, right? Because eight aces, 11 double faults. But a lot of the serves that he hit Nadal were unreturned. Uh, Shafavalov might get a racket on it, but obviously it doesn't count as an ace then. Uh, first serve percentage, you can see there Nadal impressive at 68%. 58% is a bit low for Dennis, but it's about average, so it's not horrific. First serve points one, Nadal just edging that at 79%. Uh, Shafavalov at 73 And second serve points one, you can see there, slight advantage to Shafavalov at 54%, and Nadal 46%, uh, which is very interesting. Breakpoint saved, you can see that's a huge stat as well. Nadal saving six out of eight. Uh, Shavavala, four out of seven. Uh, and then in terms of winners and unforced errors, 53 winners for Denis Shavavala, 51 unforced errors are just hitting more winners and unforced errors. But look at that from Nadal, really tidy. 41 winners and 28 unforced errors, not bad at all. Uh, in terms of net points, one, which I always find interesting, coming to the net 44 times, Shavavala, really impressive in terms of his willingness to come to the net. But at times that that volley uh, or approach volley or approach shot is not quite good enough from him, so something to work on. Uh, but the intent is there. And I think the actual tactic is not a bad one. He just needs to execute it better. I'd be at only 61% of net points won for Nadal, 85%. Um, so Nadal rolls on to the semifinals. He'll be playing Matteo Berrettini. Uh, I'm not going to do a, a huge breakdown of Berrettini Monfils because I didn't watch all of it. I did watch the last uh, two sets of it, but... Now, I don't think it would be fair to you guys to talk about it and go through the stats when really I don't have, well, I haven't watched the whole match. Um, so I wouldn't be able to talk about it in depth like I did this one. Um, but Monfils played some really good tennis. Um, Berrettini in the end of that final set, breaking early and managing to get through that. So, yeah, it, it'll be an interesting matchup for sure. Uh, obviously, a serve return. But I'll do a proper preview for that uh, later probably tomorrow, actually, for Nadal versus Berrettini. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for tuning in. Really appreciate it. Please remember to smash the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And we'll see you on the next video. Thank you very much.